you know, I had an instructor from a uh, retired American Airlines guy, my first ever jet. Uh, it was a 1985 Lear 35, and yeah. I'm in, in school, and he said, listen, he goes, the flying part, people do that on the weekends for fun, and they pay to do it. You're getting paid for the studying part, man. That's what you need to do. That's the hard part. Right. Yeah. Hello, aviators. Welcome back to the Profile Playbook Podcast, where we bring you the tips, tricks, hacks, and shortcuts to get you into a cockpit faster and cheaper. I'm Sean Ritchie. And I'm Mike Martin. And we're here again today with Jace, uh, the owner of Lunkin Flight Training, and Rick, the chief instructor at Lunkin Flight Training. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy this video. So what we're going to do on this one is we're going to really dig into these guys and talk about students that are struggling students that are dropping out, uh, what are the problems with the students? You know, the, the previous videos we've made with these guys are, what do we, you're interviewing the flight school. How do you choose a flight school? I'm gonna, I, I wanna know from these guys, what are the students that make it and what are the students that don't make it? Uh, uh, what, what are the qualities so you as the viewer can really understand what it takes to make it in one of these environments and how, what you can do to improve yourself and what to expect. Right, and throughout this series, Mike and I kind of showed up with each one of these segments, you know, somewhat mapped out of the important questions we thought somebody should be asking a flight school. But this final segment of the series, we're letting Jay and Rick just kind of riff with what problems these folks have. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, so what, when this topic comes up, what's the number one thing that comes to the top of your head of, of why students don't make it. So during onboarding, they don't show up with a medical. And we, we changed that process that they got to have a medical early on, probably almost two years ago now. Got to have a medical for onboarding because we found that a lot of the students, once they started, they couldn't get a medical for one reason or another. ADHD was, was a big, big, big issue in that. Uh, so we've changed that but you can only lead a horse to water and you can't make them drink, even though it's in all of our intro packets that, you know, get this medical, we list off AMEs, we still occasionally have students show up that they don't have a medical. So, okay, you gotta get it. We can't assign an instructor, we can't start until you, until you get the medical out of the way. We, we don't wanna always. take your money and find out that your dream job you can't do because you didn't get the medical first. This is something we're always harping on it, because of what you said, I mean, you may think everything's kosher, you know, this this one little medication you're taking, you think it would have you'd have no problem, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's on some list the FAA has that you know, now you gotta fill out this report, you gotta send it mm -hmm. out to out to uh, Oklahoma City and it's gotta be evaluated and approved. And all of this stuff takes a bunch mm -hmm. of time. Some people don't know they're colorblind. That's the other one that comes up. Yeah. Yeah. This is a common one in it, men, especially. And, and that list of medications is available online. Yep. So it's not it's like you can't find the information. <laughs> and, and if you want to do this as a career, get a first class medical. Because I'd hate for you to get a third class medical. Go out, train, get all your certificates and ratings, have Delta hire you. And when they say, give us your first class medical, you can't get one. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, you guys brought up the medical issue. I'm a little surprised. I thought in my head the first issue was going to be financial reasons. Me too. So, so where does that fall in all of this? Financial? Yeah, r running out of money. Uh, so we do have people that show up. You were joking earlier, $500 in the bank yeah. and they want to yeah. go do this. Yeah, I'm picturing a young man who's just got a summer job at the Dairy Queen. He's got $500 in his bank account. He's going to spend the summer getting his pilot's license. And uh, that's probably not the way to go about it. It's know? a great goal, but not with $500 in your bank account. Uh, you want to build up some kind of nest egg and then know that that's either going to cover it in its totality or it's enough to get you going because you have more work after that, more income to be able to continue funding at that right. level. And that goes back to, well, how many lessons a week are you going to do? Because this costs money. Right. Yeah, it, there, that is one thing aviation is, is expensive. Yeah, right. and you probably heard the joke, how do you make a small fortune in aviation? Start start with a big one. <laughs> start with exactly. a big one. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, absolutely. The finances are huge, you know, but most of these flight schools do have the finances. There's, uh, 
you know, we, we, we always tell our people, you know, beg, borrow, or steal that money, but make sure you go into it. Like you said, with a nest egg, you need a chunk of cash to eat away from. Uh, because if, if you get into that situation, starting with the example of the kid with $500 in his account and a summer job, you're going to run out of money real quick, and then you're in the waiting game. Now you're back to once a week, one lesson a week. So now every lesson you do, you spend half of it reviewing what you did the last lesson. Yes. Or even worse, there's a gap. You yep. run, we have a lot of people run out of money. We have people on hold because they ran out of money. They need to pick up a month, two months, six months later. They're going to have to repeat lessons, and overall it's going to mm -hmm. cost them even more. So it would have been better if they would have waited a little bit longer, saved up more money. So, mm -hmm. so always have plenty of money or the financing in place before you start. Yes. And, 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 and two comments just to add to that. It might not be a challenge with money, but if they have some life event that causes a delay. Yeah, right. So we've had a couple students hoping to get their private pilot certificate before they leave for college. This month, August 10th, we have several leaving to go to college. They're going to try to come back in December on Christmas break and try to move forward. What rust will have to be knocked off, a which lot. translates into then. more money there. That's the first point. Second point, going back to the, the money from a slightly different angle, we talked in an earlier podcast about how that first stage, that pre-solo stage is right. the hardest. It's difficult to predict how much that's going to cost. Right. So much of that is depending upon that student, how well prepared they are, how they study, what is their aptitude, how often they fly, which then says money. Very good, right. very good. Well, what other problems do you see with students uh, to help our viewers avoid them themselves. Study. Study. We have Study a lot of students, and I don't want to pick on them, but the younger students that we have, they're great flying the airplane. They can fly the airplane like nobody else, but then they don't know. You ask them they something about they airspace. Have, and they don't know. They haven't yeah. studied. All they want to do is fly the airplane. So are they serious about it? And we've had to have interviews. If they're under 18, we have students who are 16 and 17. We have to meet with their parents all collectively mm -hmm. yeah. because typically the money is coming from the parents. And of course, they're maybe coming from the student as well. But but we have to get everybody involved because of mm -hmm. the age of the student. And then the parents find out, oh, you fly great, but you haven't been studying. Why haven't you been studying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I had an instructor from a retired American Airlines guy in my first ever jet. Uh, it was a 1985 Lear 35. And I'm in, in school, and he said, listen, he goes, the flying part, people do that on the weekends for fun, and they pay to do it. You're getting paid for the study part, man. That's what you need to do. That's the hard part. Right. You, know? you, gotta, you have to know the rules. You have to know the airplane. You have to know the ACS. Yes. You have to know the ACS, mm -hmm. and someone has to teach you how to use the ACS. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then once you know how to use the ACS, you can, you can find your own answers and uh, mm -hmm. for the for the limitations that for the parameters you get for maneuvers and things mm -hmm. like that yep. got I got a little Cherokee I keep over there at Cincinnati West and Harrison I'm teaching my 15 and a half year old how to fly right now I want him to solo on his 16th birthday right. which is coming up here he's born 15 and a half September I want him to solo on his 16th birthday I think that would be neat but uh, kid flies the airplane great but uh, He's opened up the online course maybe three times. So he's not doing the study part. I can totally see how you're saying the young kids are not wanting to do that. Well, and, and it's not just the young kids. I, <laughs> no, I, I had a student. Just then. I had a student several years ago. Same thing. He could fly like nobody's business. Cross countries. He was nailing the waypoints, led down to the second. No problem with all yeah. of his math and everything. He never took the written. Well, I can say the nice thing is that with the with the, the syllabus we use, there are ways to prevent that not getting further ahead in flying, right? Because mm -hmm. you can oh, yeah. Rick can explain how that works because you can't go past a certain point without passing That's certain correct. quizzes. That's correct. That's correct. So it, it enforces right. that, and I, and I can look up any student on my phone and see where they are in our whole school, where they are in progress in their mm -hmm. online training. So we can follow that along. There's quizzes they have to take to get through. During onboarding, we talk about this, but the reason I mention onboarding now is that that's part of the decision process of how many lessons a week is a student going to do. The recommendation is for every lesson that you are with us, and a lesson is a two-hour block of time, you need to be studying at home at least two to four hours for that lesson. 
And if not for the things you're going to be doing in that lesson, for the things you're going to be doing in the next lesson. So just like we joke and we say we want our brain to arrive at that spot in space before the airplane does, we need our skills and our knowledge to get there before we do that lesson. And that plays part and parcel to when you think about how many lessons a week do you want to do. If you have really, really good study skills, yeah. maybe two hours at home per lesson a week that you're doing is appropriate. If you don't have really strong skills or you are concerned about your study skills, you may want to spend more time. That eats into time you can't be here for a lesson. It eats into other time in your social life or in your work life or what have you. Only that student can make that decision. So right. when we talk about them underestimating how long it's going to take, underestimating the study time, so they may have good intentions, they just can't keep up. Sure. That's great. So you get pilots overestimating their skill level. Oh, that's they not do. a surprise. <laughs> let, let, lesson three, how come I'm not ready to solo? Oh, wow. Lesson three. Lesson three. <laughs> and, and a lot of this has to do with those, those individuals are typically high achievers. You know, so think type A personality okay. and think, you know, they're very aggressive. They're high achievers. They've been successful in their lives. So this might be the hobbyist who's a CEO of a company or something yeah. of that sort. Yeah. So that type of person, you just have to stick to the facts, stick to the ACS. You got to hold plus or minus 100 feet. You got to hold plus or minus 10 degrees. Did, did you complete the task to that standard? Yes or no? Oh, I guess I didn't. Well, that's why you're not ready for, for solo right now. Man, that's just crazy that somebody down here at Lunkin would be saying within three lessons. I mean, it probably takes you three lessons to figure out how to talk on the radio. <laughs> yes. Well, and we have some students that are gun shy about talking on oh, the radio I've, I've and, and they stumble all over themselves and I feel bad for them, but that's part and parcel of what we've got to do. What a yeah. nice segue into towered or non-towered airport yeah. for learning how to that, fly. That's and a question we kind of get back mm -hmm. to choosing yeah. a flight school, but, the, but a weakness could be that, that your radio skills, uh, 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 depending on where you learn how to fly, may not be up mm -hmm. to snuff sooner. Ah, they will get there. Yes. Yes. They yes. will get there no matter what. But, but a towered airport, you're going to learn them a lot quicker and feel a lot more comfortable sooner because you're immersed into it from day one. From day one. Right. That's a little bit of a loaded question, though. When people ask us this, I, you know, I look at Lunkin, and it's a towered airport, but I don't put it into the same category as, like, you know, those kids down at Riddle at Daytona oh, Beach, no, and different. there's two other flight schools. I mean, that's where I renewed all my CFI stuff. We would sit for 0 .7, 0 .8 in line to take off in the conga line yeah yeah yes. so now that now you're going backwards you know uh, but lunkin no you're probably gonna well, and, and that's why it's a loaded head. a loaded question so, it really depends upon where is that towered airport right and i'll right. let you in on a little right. flight school secret no matter right. where, where you go there's flight schools that are near us that don't have a tower they're going to spin it to we don't have a tower you can get out to your lesson a oh, little sure. quicker it's going to be mm -hmm. less expensive right. but they have to come to a tower so the right answer mm -hmm. you can spin it however yeah. The right answer is you are either at one that is at a tower, class probably class Delta versus mm -hmm. Charlie or Bravo if you're rating them, not right. saying mm -hmm. that the other ones are impossible. Uh, they they, they might just over, might yeah, it, you want to train out of the parts world, <laughs> right? But another, another airport that is in proximity mm -hmm. and f you frequently use it as a practice airport, the airport with the tower, right. you know, reasonable distance, not 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of places in the U.S. where that's true, but here... There's airports all over that within mm -hmm. 15 miles. Lunkin, uh, even CVG, mm -hmm. uh, they're busy, but but 1-8 right over there, they let us over there all the time because they hardly use that mm -hmm. runway, yeah, and they welcome that. us. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of touch and goes on 1-8 right, which is a gigantic well, airport. Well, they a gigantic welcome runway. you because they have, after they built that thing, you know, right after they built that, they kept a sign and a bunch of airplanes to that runway, and everybody complained, oh, we get the other side, you know, we're yeah. going to the F can we get? But yeah. they had to show so much traffic on that runway after right. they Justified. spend a they want those dollars. operations yeah. because yeah, they get exactly. more funding yeah and exactly. that's how it works so, so they want to serve it another way to think of towered versus non-towered is soft field operations do you do grass strips yeah yeah i mean i used to i so, love it and the reason for that it's interesting to me how many of our instructors that we've brought on board unless they're homegrown have no grass strip experience we have two grass strips that we have insurance approval that we can use them in private pilot training Okay. We have to That's take great. our instructors out there to sign them off for insurance purposes. And that's an internal policy. That's internal. Sure. 
and almost every one of them have never been on a grass strip before and they've been all the way through all of their training even in the double eye right. and they've never been to an honest to goodness grass strip wow so kind of think the similarity of that with towered or non-towered you got to do it at some point in time right oh, yeah. so right. let's go out to soft field and let's let's do it for real and have fun yeah when i was learning how to fly uh, I did all my primary private stuff out in South Dakota while I was in the military. And, uh, yeah, we would land at these little bitty nothing grass strips everywhere. And mm -hmm. some of, you know, a lot of those grass strips are not flat no. at all. No. You know, so you really learn the, I mean, there's like a couple of times, oh, my God, we hit the prop. You know, yeah. you really learn the importance of you know, riding yeah. that wheelie. Oh, yeah. and, and you get the, the cornfields on both sides. Yeah. It feels like it's a Death Star trench when you're going down into it. I mean, it's That's awesome. Right. It's right. awesome. It's but very that, that to me is similar to the whole towered or non-towered. There's pros and cons to each and it's yeah. very situational dependent yep. as to where you are. Excellent. Good, good awesome. stuff. Well, this is uh, really good for the viewers to think about, you know, uh, the pitfalls and make sure that they can not do that themselves so mm -hmm. that that's a lot of great information anything else any other advice you could think of i think we're good and yeah. we have covered fun in this series we, have fun. To, have we appreciate fun. you guys coming yeah this has been a great series i we mean we've this, hit so much stuff yeah. yeah yeah and and we put up with how busy we are today with uh, with 40 yeah. plus flights and they're they've been taxing in and out all yes. day and we've had to pause this video yeah, yeah. thanks yeah. for your patience doing that <laughs> but thanks for your yeah. Yeah. Hopefully the, the planes are literally 15 feet behind the camera yeah. going by. Right. So yeah. awesome. Well, thanks everybody for viewing the podcast. Please like and subscribe. That's what gives us the inspiration to 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 keep doing this. Download our new app the in the Apple App Store. There's a ProPilot Playbook app. Check all that out. If you have any questions, you can email us at podcast at ProPilotPlaybook.com. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Thank you.